Hi guys, we're going to talk about chapter one. Chapter one is just really diving into the foundations of mental health and mental illness. So I think the first thing you just have to ask yourself is, what does mental health mean? Not mental illness, but what does mental health mean? And really that's that ability to realize your own abilities. You can cope with normal stressors of life, and you have the ability to productively work and contribute to a community. And that is being mentally health. <clears throat> so as we define mental health, um, it's an emotional, psychological well-being of an individual who has the capacity to interact with others. They can deal with ordinary stress, and they can perceive one's own surrounding realistically. As we keep thinking about this wellness side, wellness is being in good physical and mental health. Improving physical health can benefit our mental health and vice versa. Wellness is not the absence of disease. So you can still really work on improving your physical and mental health even in the presence of disease, it doesn't mean you have the absence of disease because we're talking about wellness. There are eight dimensions of wellness. Um, you can see those there on that little flower. Um, emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. Mental health problems significantly impact the process of wellness. Individuals with mental health problems are more likely to die decades earlier than that general public um, from preventable diseases. People with serious mental health problems often face social, economic, and or environmental disadvantages that can really result in a lack of access to healthcare, lack of information, and lack of culturally and linguistically competent care programs. So let's think about the traits of mental health. When we think about mental health, that provides people with rational thinking, communication skills, learning, emotional growth, resilience, and self-esteem. How many of you remember mental illness as having behaviors that were considered either strange or different? So what we have learned is thinking about mental illness in a way that makes us very judgmental. So what does mental illness refer to? It refers to a psychiatric disorder that have a definable diagnosis. There can be manifestations and significant dysfunctions related to development, biological, and physiological disturbances. The ability to think might be impaired. So if we think about our Alzheimer's patients, emotions could be affected. That's when we start thinking about our depressed patients. Behavioral alteration could be apparent. So maybe our schizophrenic patients. Patients maybe in some cases display a combination of each of those alterations. So you may see um, the ability to think and emotions are altered, the ability to think and their behavior is altered. So those are your three typical misbehaviors. Um, you could have one or multiple of one. So as we look at our mental health continuum, um, mental health is that general condition of people um, and the category are well, right? Um, we are able to help with our stressors, we can cope with our stressors, um, we can function in community. Um, so we're on that very end of that spectrum or that continuum um, with our mental health. We might experience some stress occasionally, some mild stress, but it really doesn't impair our daily function. So an example of someone here may spend a day or two under a dark cloud of self-doubt, maybe a sleepless night, 
worrying, but they're aware of this and they can still function well and find coping mechanisms to help alleviate those concerns. At the opposite end of this continuum is mental health problems. So emotional problems or concerns with mild to moderate distress and impairment. So maybe we're losing sleep, we've lost our appetite. Um, if that distress increases, them, then they may seek help. Temporary impairments may be that um, individuals have some mild depression, generalized anxiety, maybe some ADHD um, patients might fit into this category. The most severely affected individuals fall into mental illness on that continuum. There's altered thinking, altered mood, behavior, those all become a real big concern. So a distinguishing factor for this group is marked distress with moderate to disabling impairment. We will all at some point maybe fall somewhere on this continuum. That shift may be gradual, it may be sudden, some people may never move into the mental illness side and some will reach that severe level and recover and be able to leave a, lead a very satisfying life. So what do I mean when I say individual attributes? Um, that really refers to those inborn and learned characteristics that make us who we are. We all can manage our thoughts, feelings, and everyday pressures of life in very unique ways. When we talk about resilience, we talk about those individuals that have endured tragedy, maybe loss, trauma, or severe stress and the ability and capacity to secure resources needed to support that well-being. Resilience does not mean that you aren't affected by stress. It just means that you have that capability to regulate your emotions and not fall victim to those negative thoughts. Some of the characteristics of resilience are optimism, a sense of mastery, or a sense of competence. And these are all, all these characteristics are really essential to recovery. Perception of mental health and mental illness. There is a distinct difference between mental illness and physical illness. Mental meaning brain and the higher thought process. Physical meaning the connections, functions, and spinal inner innervations. The biggest perception of mental illness is that psychiatric disorder implies that it's all in our head, right? We're talking about the brain um, and the higher thought process. So if we have a concern with that, we can always just think, is it in our head? Which leads us to that stigma and um, that they're flawed, um, socially shunned, disgraced or maybe even shamed. There are no specific tests to diagnose psychiatric disorders. We can't go give our patient a CT and tell them they have ADHD, right? There's no MRI that can compare to someone that might have epilepsy, right? You're going to see those different brain waves in an MRI with epilepsy, but you can't tell them that they have depression with an MRI. So there are no specific tests that are going to diagnose that. So trying to explain the unexplainable can sometimes be very challenging. So let's talk a little bit about stigma. I do have a really great video. Um, I will try to get posted with this um, or we'll watch it in class. Um, but the biggest take home is that if you wouldn't say something to a healthy person, then you would, shouldn't say it to an unhealthy person as well. We have to really be careful with our words. So I want you to just kind of think about some common words people use that could really be viewed as stigma. Some of the ones that come to my mind are crazy, unhinged, psychotic, insane, lunatic, unbalanced, right? If you hear those words, does it automatically move your brain into someone that is unhealthy? 
Um, so it's really putting a big stigma on that. What about the phrase schizophrenic or committed suicide? Um, placing blame on the individuals um, is never a really great idea, right? We don't want to ever blame someone from dying from cancer. So why do we want to blame someone for having schizophrenia or blame someone for committing suicide, right? Um, remember these, that these are people and they are not diseases. So better terminology um, might be a person with schizophrenia or a person died of suicide or lost by suicide. Stigma is one of the major barriers to treatment, recovery, and social integration. Individuals are not going to seek um, treatment or continue treatment if they encounter any type of stigma. So labeling, labeling our individuals with mental illness as different would be a big stigma. Linking them to, it links them to a negative stereotype. It leads again to that social distancing self from stigmatized people. Types of different stigmas are public. Um, so when we think about our public stigma, they're at risk of being subjected to prejudice and discrimination. Common stereotypes include the person is dangerous, unpredictable, and incapable of functioning. Self-stigma is when the individuals are aware of the public negative view and they begin to agree with that perception. So you may hear patients say, I have a mental illness, so I must be incompetent. And then the other type of stigma is label avoidance. So just really avoiding, they're avoiding treatment in order to not be labeled. So we can think about psychological disorders. They're really gonna result from an interaction between inherent vulnerability and environmental stressors. So you can look at this diathesis stress model. Diathesis is that biological predisposition. So maybe our patients have an increased chance of developing a disease or pattern of behavior really just based off of their genes. Um, they inherit it from the parent, right? That's that diathesis part of this model. When we look at this stress, um, what are the environmental stressors? Has there been any trauma? Um, and that will help if we have both a diathesis component and a stress component, um, that's when we might see that disorder. Most accept, this is the most accepted explanation for mental illness is this model. You can also have a combination of genetic vulnerability um, with negative environmental stressors. So you could have just the diathesis part, um, but you really, if you, if you're going to have both, if you're going to have the stress, then you're probably also going to have the diathesis part as well. So let's look a little bit at social influences on mental health care. And this really started over 100 years ago. Mental health consumers began to advocate for their rights for treatment. In 1979, a nationwide advocacy group called NAMI. You have probably seen several commercials about NAMI especially at the beginning of this pandemic, was formed um, to demand patient involvement in their treatment process. Decades of the Brain, designated by President George H.W. Bush, was declared to make the public more aware of advances in neuroscience. And then in 2003, New Freedom Commission on Mental Health stated that mental health care in America is in shambles and they called for a streamlined system. Mental Health Parity Act, um, mental health coverage should be and would be equivalent to our med surge coverage annually. Concerns after it was implemented um, by insurance was that several limitations were actually put on that coverage. So that Mental Health Parity Act really um, helped those patients be able to get the same type of a treatment as if they had gone in for an appendectomy. 
When we look at epidemiology of mental disorders, this is our prevalence. And these are just some examples of what you might see as you enter into your nursing career and out in the big nursing world. Um, major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability, about 6.7 um, prevalence percent prevalence over the last 12 months. Schizophrenia is 1.1%, so a little bit less. Panic disorders, 2.7% prevalence over the last 12 months. Um, you'll see that really beginning in our adolescents. Um, and one in three will develop that agor agoraphobia, um, where a lot of times they don't leave the house because they're so afraid something's going to happen that's going to cause them to panic. And then generalized anxiety, 3.1% prevalence over the last 12 months. Um, again, childhood, middle, childhood to middle age is where we're going to see the, our highest risk. I do want you to be familiar with the DSM-5. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition. Um, it's a classification system used in the U.S. in planning for patient care and determining reimbursement for services. DSM-5 is the most widely used um, book to identify disorders based off of criteria. Classifications are based off disorders, not people. So you'll see schizophrenia spectrum disorder and not the term schizophrenic um, or substance related uh, disorders, not alcoholics. So you're gonna see it just, terminology is gonna be a little bit different with it because we're remembering we're basing it off of the disorder not that very specific person. So we're viewing the people as people and not as an illness. The ICD-10 CM is more globally used, um, but then the US has adapted some of it. Um, that's what the CM is for, those clinical modifications. So as we look at our psychiatric mental health nurses, um, these nurses are typically employed purposeful use of self. They promote mental health through assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of behavioral concerns, mental disorders, and comorbid condition. These nurses work with patients throughout the lifespan, so it can start as early as pediatrics, move into adolescents, adults, and even into the elderly. They assist with crisis, or those with acute life problems, as well as those with just chronic mental illnesses. So you will see them employed in a variety of settings. There are different levels of psychiatric nursing practice. The basic level um, are those nurses that are qualified to practice um, really just at that basic level. They coordinate care, they have health teaching, um, they help with maintenance teaching, collaboration, um, therapies, things like that. The next level up is your advanced practice. Um, that's when medication prescription and treatment can be done, maybe some psychotherapy and consultations. These nurses typically have their master's or their doctorate in psychiatric nursing. So each role does have clearly defined roles, basic level, is you or I, advanced would be if we really just wanted to get into um, psychiatric nursing, get a master's in it or maybe a doctorate in it and we could do more um, medication, treatment, consultations, things like that. And that concludes chapter one. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Otherwise, we can chat about it in class. Thanks guys.